and welcome to the Minds of Mountain Film. I'm Elizabeth Hightower Allen from Outside Magazine, and I'm here with Dr. Theo Colburn of the Endocrine Disruption Exchange. It's lovely to meet you, Dr. Colburn. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, good, good. Well, um, watching Gasland last night, it was a, it was just an incredible eye opener. And you have called these endocrine disruptive chemicals a pandemic that they have affected every environment on our planet including the womb and that they are more of an imminent threat to us than climate change and where where are these where are these chemicals coming from well surprisingly no you the movie last night remember focused on natural gas yes. what most people don't realize is that better than 50% of natural gas goes to make plastics mm. and glass Glass is impregnated with these resins. Really? Oh, yes. So that's why glass does, it shatters now. It doesn't break in big sheets. And it, 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 actually, you can build buildings with glass because of the strength these resins have given to the materials that we use for construction. They've actually contributed to the phasing out of steel. Really? Yes, but, these, they, but they're also used to make uh, fabrics. Uh -huh. And they're also used to make plastics. I mean, I'm right. sorry, not plastics, pesticides, right. and uh, pharmaceuticals. So this problem of endocrine disruption, of course, is something that most people who are investing in products that are coming into your home, the people who are making the chemicals, the people who are producing natural gas, would rather the public would not hear. And so this is sort of like a hidden reason, another reason why possibly humanity or human beings are more at risk than climate change. Because we're now in about the third, going into the fourth generation of individuals who are exposed in the womb. Right. And we, what we know about these chemicals is that they interfere with the hormones that actually control from the moment the sperm enters the egg until the baby is born and throughout that child's life. You're sitting here. Right. under the control of hormones. And that those, they operate at about a part per trillion, a part per billion in your body. Right. And now we're also facing this pandemic that you mentioned that basically includes things like diabetes and one in every third child born now, they predict, is going to have diabetes. Accompanying that, of course, you have the obesity problem, which people are now calling the uh, metabolic syndrome. Huh. We also have the what would they call the male testicular syndrome, where you look at the abnormal development of the male gonads, as well as reduction in uh, testosterone production, reduction in uh, sperm count and sperm quality being affected, leading to infertility problems. Uh, it, the list is endless of these kinds of disorders. We know also those affecting the brain, which I think is so important, from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to uh, uh, behavioral problems. We have the problem with um, a childhood uh, disorders and behavioral problems where children then become uh, involved with the criminal justice system and then eventually end up as criminals. And a lot of this has been traced back to prenatal exposure to chemicals in practically every instance that were either derived from um, natural gas directly, from the byproducts of cracking crude oil, mm. or the burning of coal. Really? So that even these toxic trace metals that we always knew were dangerous, and we have standards set for what you can be exposed to, now we know we have to go back and look at their exposure in the womb at about 10,000 times lower the dose than we've ever been testing these chemicals. And these chemicals now are turning up as powerful endocrine disruptors as well, interfering with how the baby is constructed. constructed. Wow. So when, how the cells move, how the cells bud, how the cells produce ducts, and the ductile system in the prostate has been mapped. Actually, you can see it in journals now. They're showing how this abnormal development of this ductile system takes place as both in the prostate and in the breast, which later 
of course, in the laboratory, when the animals are exposed to this one particular chemical we know so much about, that's BPA, yes. bisphenol A, uh, prenatal exposure in parts per trillion to the mother of rat or mouse, actually, in adulthood, these animals have developed organs that are basically full of the kinds of structures and producing and acting the way uh, they are in humans when they develop cancer in their later years. Oh my God. So it's a typical kind of cancer. You can follow it in the same way with the prostate. But it traces back to the in utero exposure. Well, you have, you know, BPA is a wonderful thing to start with because it's on everyone's minds right now. We're not microwaving things in plastic. They've had to take it out of the water bottles. Um, but I feel like for, for several years, it's, it's almost been a women's issue. It's been for nursing mothers or don't let your children have it. But you've said that uh, you have a video on your site called The Male Predicament. And you have said that it is, it's more, these, uh, these chemicals can be more disruptive to males. Yes, it's very it? interesting that you should raise that. Yes, yeah. what we're finding is that the boys do seem to be more vulnerable when it comes to gonadal development. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, they have external genitalia that we can see, remember? Right. Yes, but I also <laughs> um, in sperm count. And um, fertility problems now, in many uh, clinics they're finding around the country, the problem is more in the male than in the female. But also, the brain is the part that I'm so very much concerned about. It is the impact of the brain on the males when it comes to the development of the part of the brain. They don't seem to develop as much of this part of the brain. It's called the splenium. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been traced back to chemicals called PCBs. Yes. Remember the old PCBs? I, I do, in the Hudson River. River that's I right, do. the kinds of chemicals that bioaccumulate. Looking at the children, of mothers who ate fish out of the Great Lakes, and then looking at the concentration of PCBs in the cord blood of these children, and then following them through to age seven and eight, and looking at their ability to pass an IQ test. In other words, they found a significant five to 10, even as high as a 12 point drop in IQ, and it was always more prevalent in the boys than it was in the girls. Um, really? Also, um, then there was, uh, they tested these children too at age seven to see how they would do in a uh, test in responding to a visual cue and how they would respond to it and uh, how then also they could shut off that response. In other words, you get this compulsive behavior so they tested them for their compulsive behavior. And again, the boys basically uh, had more errors of commission. Mm. They would maybe click the button too soon when they were to see this thing on the screen, on the TV screen, a cat in a window. Right. Or they would miss it, or it would be too late. But uh, so they made far more errors in that kind of verbal, visual translation of what they were seeing. Now, I want to back up a little bit. How you began studying this in the in the 70s. How much more prevalent do you see these things now, um, all these endocrine disruptors than even uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago? Are we, are we multiplying well, the exposures? The, well, well yeah. actually, if you go back, I really, I, I think if people could get my DVD, they could see it. It's so easy to put on a graph. Yes. But basically, it was around 1944, World War ended and all of this uh, petroleum, natural gas was being used to make war gases mm -hmm. and all kinds of terrific equipment and material so we could win the war, enough to make lighter aeroplanes to fight with, that sort of thing. They, that industry needed to find another market. So they started making products for the home. Remember, science yes. was going to make, yes. and chemistry was going to make life better. and. Um, and, and Rachel Carson would have picked this up if she had lived just a couple more years, believe me. She was on to this well, problem. Well, you carried her torch. So, well, I hope so a little, but uh, certainly didn't have her writing skills, that's for sure. But, but here again, um, then during those 40s and 50s, the first generation of people who were exposed to these chemicals 
coming into their homes because we use these things as fire retardants. Mm -hmm. they, they, so they, we could have electricity. We wouldn't have the electricity today without fire retardants. Most of those are made from this fossil fuel source, mm -hmm. petroleum source. Right. Petroleum meaning natural gas and also uh, uh, oil. Right. So um, then what happened was, of course, in about 1950, 1960, those people began having the first batch of children. Right. So we have this epidemiological record from about the 1940s right through until about 1970. Everything looked pretty good. But if you start looking at the human epidemiological studies that were done, we found out that immediately, right around 1970, when this next generation was born, you began to see a reduction in the number of boys who were born. Hmm. Because the studies that are being done in other countries, not in the United States, shows that the boys' babies are dying prior to birth, oh. more often than girls. Oh. And the Japanese have been following this. So they are now looking, just recently they just broke with a new study where they're finding that the boys are dying three times sooner, or before birth, than the girls. Oh my gosh. But then from birth on, then the death rate matches. Yeah. But, uh, but they were losing the boys. And uh, there are populations of Native Americans now around the Great Lakes where, you know, the normal ratio of boys to girls is 106 boys to 100 girls. But up along the, the uh, St. Lawrence River and the uh -huh. Detroit River, those native populations are producing 56 boys to 100 girls. Really? Yes. Well, that'll be terrible for the girls when they start dating as well. well they won't you know, have any I mean, dates. I was always tall and skinny, and I grew up during World War II. Right. And there weren't enough girls around then. <laughs> I mean, enough boys around it then. You know, there are always too many girls. But, but, the, but, but that's, see, that's a signal. And right. then things began to grow. So it's like this diabetes thing. It just crept up on us. You know, here, in, in what, this 1970 to now? So now our concern is that these were all the kinds of disorders that I mentioned were all rare. They were unusual. And mm -hmm. there was always a certain percentage of the population, the normal population way over here, the normal curve, who would have these problems. But what is happening now, they're shifting into the mainstream when one third of the population yeah. are going to be developing disorders that are irreversible. They're going to have to be taken care of. We're producing basically a society of people that have to be taken care of. We're a caretaker society. Well, and we often blame them for, you know, how, how did you get that diabetes? Surely you haven't been taking care of yourself without right. thinking about the stressors inherent in their, in right. their physical development. Well, we know this bisphenol A Basically, you can feed it to animals in the laboratory, and it definitely interferes with the beta cells that produce insulin, which is a hormone. And most people I speak to don't even know that insulin is a hormone. Yeah. So they wouldn't even know that that is part of the endocrine system. Most people don't understand it. Well, now you have spent such a long time understanding it yourself. I want to go back to when you, you were a sheep farmer here in Colorado near near Paonia, right? Yes. With your, four children of your own. Mm -hmm. When did you first start to think there's something going on with, with our water? Or You became an activist before you became a scientist. Oh, well, I was working as a pharmacist, but also yeah. operating a small farm. Uh -huh. and we had to irrigate. I had to irrigate land. Yeah. And it didn't take me long to realize that we were irrigating land that we never should have irrigated. John Wesley Powell told us not try to do it. Right, you know, <laughs> he did. We should have listened. We should have But listened. here we were, and I could see all this alkali, they call it caliche, uh -huh, building yeah. up down Kalichi in mud. the valleys, mm -hmm. which real estate agents say, oh, if you just come out here, throw a little crusted wheatgrass, you can grow anything on that stuff. You can't. And basically, my husband got fooled by this kind of language. That's why we moved here. Oh, he's he wanted to. <laughs> he always wanted. What to. were you going to grow? He was going to raise beef. Raise beef. He loves. Yes. He loved prime rib. Right. <laughs> he said, "I'm going to just get he some said, of my I'm own." I'm going to do some of my own. But so I began to see these problems as I worked in the various communities as a relief pharmacist. Uh -huh. The pharmacists always have to be in a store, or you have to shut the store down. Right. And there were no people around like me. So all the pharmacists would call and say, I want to take a day fishing. Can I get you this particular week? And I started doing relief pharmacy. 
And it was amazing to me how uh, watching the turnover of the various pharmaceuticals, the drugs on the shelves, going out in the various communities that I went to, that there was definitely something wrong, and they were different. The disorders were different. And all I could think was, well, we don't have any aquifers out here in the West. We live on surface water. Right. The common denominator in these communities, it must be water. Right. And then when I saw how we were misusing the water and irrigating land that shouldn't be, and reusing the water, and if you live in As the- As it gets more and more alkaline or- Yes. 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 Yeah. You know, of course it starts out in the mountains. Right. It's pure water that suddenly becomes acid right. from that little carbon dioxide. So way up here in the mountains, it's acidic, pure, beautifully acidic water that can actually dissolve toxic trace metals in the high altitude streams. Yeah. And that's where I did my research, looking at how aquatic insects accumulate these toxic trace metals in their exoskeletons. Was it hard to find an audience for what you were finding? I think I, I read in Stol Our Stolen Future that you said they just treated you like a little lady in tennis shoes. Oh, sure. They yeah. still do. They still do. <laughs> yes. And it's really fun if I want to go somewhere and not be, you know, question why I'm in a particular place. I dress like this and wear my binoculars. And wear your binoculars. <laughs> and wear you're binoculars watcher. and I'm just birding. It's a good way to get into areas where you probably shouldn't be trespassing now that we're cordoning off a lot of the West for natural gas for you because where natural gas is being exploited now or re extracted from the ground, uh, you, you can't go near anymore. Right. When I first got involved, I could wander onto these things and look at the equipment and watch what was going on. But now because of um, the, uh, the terrorism's law, you know, industry yeah. now has the ability to fence off everything they're doing. Well, what and can't, what, we're, I think we're running, we're running short on time, but I wanted to talk about what can we do? It seems like the scientific results are so clear that these toxins are affecting us in ways that no congressman or regulator would want their families to be affected. How, when will this, when will we wake up and what, what, what can we do about this? Well, we, fit, we have a few strongholds yeah. today at the federal level who really understand it and get it. Yeah. In most instances, it's because they've personalized it. Something has happened with their family. Right. And as the odds get greater and greater that more children are going to be born damaged, we're going to see more interest on the part of legislators. They're going to try to help us. I definitely feel that's what's going to happen. So look, look, and, and my big concern is that we're all exposed to products. It's the cosmetics, perfumes. People have no idea how dangerous perfumes are. Nail polish, cleaning compounds the fireproofing on the material you buy, right. the, um, your automobiles. We should know what's in the products we're purchasing. And as citizens, we can change the market by basically deselecting products. And But the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we can get a law that requires full disclosure right. of everything that's in these products. And this applies also to this huge industry that's taking place in the United States right now where we've got a perfect example down in the Gulf. Yes. They're using products called dispersants, but they're only telling us about one chemical so far that we know that's in that dispersant. That's a very dangerous chemical. That's also been used in natural gas. Right. My group, basically, we have been trying to collect as much information on the products that they're using to get natural gas out of the ground the drilling is just as dirty as the fracking. People should be aware of that. The chemicals that are involved are just as dangerous. We now have 944 chemicals on that list. 407, 43% of those products, they tell us absolutely nothing about. You do not know what you are using. So education and awareness. Awareness, but disclosure. How are we going to find out? Only only 13% of the products tell you what's in them to the brim. They're not telling us how they're filling these barrels, these drums, these 650 gallon totes of chemicals they're taking and injecting in millions of gallons underwater, I mean underground today. Right. We have to have that information. Now the sad part of that is 
we have been able to identify 635 chemicals that are in those products. But the names of the chemicals that they give us are so obtuse that we've only been able to identify about 350 of the chemicals by what are called chemical abstract numbers, CAS number. Yes. And it's from that then that we've been able to design these what we call probability bars that tell the person who is interested how many health problems that are that this particular chemical can cause. And they can go to your website. They can go to our website. Which is what's the give us the address. And yes, that's endocrine disruption dot org. And you can find out all about And you can find all about this. Okay. Well it's been such a pleasure. Theo to speak with you. I've, I've really enjoyed it and I'm going to put this to use in my own life and I know all of us it's, it's a real gift that you're giving all of us by teaching us about these things. So. Okay, just do one thing. Just switch to glass. Okay. They're making glass that you can freeze in now. The, the jar companies are making freezable glass and you may break something once in a while. I have. I've switched to glass and I'm going to so continue. So switch to glass for sure and do not nuke anything in the microwave okay. that says microwave safe because that's all based on cancer, the probability of getting cancer. Oh. Not these long-term, very, very, oh, just heartbreaking disorders that parents have to live with now as they're raising their children. All right, well, it affects all of us, so. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right.